Church, everybody, how y'all doing? Awesome, man. Uh, y'all came out in droves for Mother's Day, I'm telling you. It's great. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room. Glad to uh, get to celebrate with you. And I just want to, I just want to say, I don't, um, we don't, we don't say this enough, but um, we're so grateful for the moms in the room because uh, not only do you guys make huge contributions to your families, but you guys make huge contributions to our church. And you make our church a much better place, and we, um, as being a part of this church, uh, get to glean from you and, uh, and be recipients and, and be shown what it looks like to love well and, and all of those things. So I'm just so grateful for the moms we have here at Lake Springs, and, uh, and happy Mother's Day. Glad you guys are all here hanging out with us today. Um, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 16 to kind of get started. So if you want to open your Bible to Genesis 16, just open the front cover and flip a few pages toward uh, the back. Uh, don't go too far, uh, but just about 16 pages. And, uh, and then uh, we'll be in Genesis 16. Uh, and we're in our, our, we're in our remnant of vision series here at our church, talking through the vision of our church and um, the idea of being a remnant of faith, a, a resilient group of disciples of Jesus Christ in a culture of compromise, both religiously and secularly. And so we've laid out this idea, this vision to be a holy people, a set apart people in Holly Springs, that we are here for God's purpose, that, that we aren't here for our own uh, selves as much as we are here to do his will and what he calls us into. We believe that God calls us into that and leads us into that through making sure we put an emphasis on things like formation and and truly living with renewed minds that always stem from the grace and mercy given to us in Jesus Christ. Um, and then we, we also talked about this idea of hospitality and how we love um, everyone humbly seeing each person as a brother or sister in Christ. And last week we had our mission partners up here and we were able to just share with them and listen and hear from them on what it looks like to serve uh, around the corner and around the world and truly be people uh, who are living out the great commandment and the great commission. And this week we're talking about our value of family on no better day than Mother's Day. We're going to talk about our value of family and the vision behind family is this to see God bring out the best in family shaping households to be places of love joy peace and hope. That's what we that, that that's what we envision the families at Lake Springs will have. That you guys will will be like like God will bring out the best in your family. And your household will be shaped into a place of love, joy, peace, and hope. But this is difficult, to be sure. Um, there are lots of things that we're going against. I'm going to share with you just a few statistics of studies that have been done uh, that make this really, really difficult. Are you ready? All right, so a large-scale study was done not too long ago, and it now shows that con uh, conclusively uh, that people are not experiencing transformation in church anymore. It also shows that an estimated 8 out of 10 youth uh, they, uh, from evangelical Christian homes walk away from their faith at age 23. Less than 2 out of 5 who believe the Bible, or, or, or less than 2 out of 5 who believe the Bible is God's word, read it more than once a week. Only 1 out of 4 American Christians study the Bible regularly to find direction for their lives. The increase, or, or sorry, the emotional intelligence um, of people inside the church is not any different than outside the church. People's increased love for God is not translating to an increased love for people. The increase of Christian singles who cohabitate um, before being married has exploded over the last 10 years, particularly in ages under 35. Divorce rates are just as high amongst born-again believers as it is other groups. And um, uh, according to Focus on the Family, approximately 20% of people who call their pastoral line for care uh, call with issues of sexual misconduct and pornography. So, yay. Family's doing great. <laughs> now, those, those are the statistics. Now, those statistics were pulled from, from studies done almost 15 years ago. 
And I don't think we've really gained ground in the kingdom headed in a positive direction most of those things, if we're honest. So those statistics may actually be worse now than they were then. But here are the facts that you can take away just by knowing that those are true things and true studies that have been done. Here's the facts. One, the church is a less formative place than our homes and our culture. Two, children leave the church the first chance they get. Three, our homes are places where we read secular material, news, watch TV, play video games more than we read God's word. Direction is often found in other places outside of the Bible. Marriages and households are just as fragile in the church as outside the church. People do not respect the covenant of marriage that's talked about in the Bible. And our families are full of sexual addiction and sin. So these are the things that we're up against. These are the legacies, not of just households, but Christian households. And this is what we are passing down from generation to generation. Now, when, if you've ever come to our heart and soul class where I talk about our vision, talk about our church, how to get connected, all that kind of stuff, you'll hear me talk about our value of family at that class. And you'll often hear me reference this verse from Exodus 34, why I believe family is so important for our formation and becoming more like Jesus. It's this. It says this in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. It says, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, yet de does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. I love this verse when it starts out because it's like God is compassionate and he's slow to anger and he's abounding in loyal love and faithfulness and he's gracious. And kind. He's got like all of these descriptions of God's character and who he is and it's so beautiful and so great. And then I struggle so hard with the end of this because right after he talks about the loyal love and compassion and graciousness and all of that faith, like all of that stuff, he says, but he, but he punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. That's so, so heart-wrenching. <laughs> and yet, I think one of the things that, that is particularly interesting about it is that it's when, 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 uh, when we write that he punishes the children, the word punishes is probably better translated. There's probably a better translation for, than, than punishes. It's probably more like the consequences of the parents. Or the things that the, the sins of the parents continually get repeated. We don't really have a good way of translating it. And, but, but he's saying basically that the sins of the parents continually get repeated to three and four generations. And you know, and you should know, and you should kind of take to heart. Like if that is true, and I'm pretty sure it is true. I'm going to give you a biblical example of where it plays itself out and how it's true today. But, but if that is true and you know your own sin and you know your parents' sin and you know your grandparents' sin, that, that doesn't make us feel too great about where, where we're headed with our kids, does it? And so we have to figure out how do we, how do we navigate this and how do we deal with this. So we're going to look at a family in the scriptures where this pattern plays out, but we're also going to look at how does this pattern get broken? How does this pattern get broken? Because it isn't, it doesn't have to be this way. It can be broken, all right? So let's go to Genesis chapter 16. Have your Bible. Hopefully you're already there. I gave you some time to get there. Um, so, um, all right. Genesis 16 says this, verse 1, ready? Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had, had been living in Canaan for ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her 
husband as his wife, and he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Okay, so I don't have to do a whole lot of expository breakdown of that for you guys to know that's jacked up, right? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't have to go, well, you know, the Hebrew says, like, that's pretty messed up, right? Like, take your slave and, and sleep with her. Let's start a family that way. That's a good idea. No, uh, it's not. All right. Uh, we, all, we all know this. Okay. Let's go to chapter 20. All right. Same family. This time their names have changed to Abraham and Sarah. Same family, though. Okay. Chapter 20, verse 1. Here is something we are going to see. Now, Abraham moved on from there into the region of the Negev and lived uh, between Kadesh and Shur, for a while he stayed in Gergar, or Gerar. And there Abraham said to his wife Sarah, or said of his wife Sarah, she is my sister. Then Abimelech the king of Gerar sent for Sarah and took her. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, you are as good as dead because that woman you have taken, she is married woman. Now, Abimelech had not gone near her, so he said, Lord, are you going to destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me that she is my sister, and did she not say that he is my brother? I have, I have done nothing, or I've done this with a clear conscience and with clean hands. And then God said to him in a dream, yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience, so I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why, you, or that is why um, I did not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you. And you will live. Okay. So I, I've been married 14 years. Okay. I, it's safe to say. I don't know everything about marriage. But if I went up to another man. And just gave my wife away. And said she's my sister. I'm pretty sure my wife would have a problem with that. Right. <laughs> Any other wives in the room agree? Yeah. I'm glad. Okay. So, so here's. here's I mean that's, that's also really jacked up. Isn't it? And flip one page. Go to chapter 21. Let's go to 21. Here it goes. 21, verse 8, says this. The ch child grew up and was weaned. This time, uh, uh, Sarah actually had a child. She just had a child, Isaac. And so she, she had a child, weaned. And the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of the slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share the inheritance of my son Isaac. So it starts out really, really bad. He's like, she, she's like, here, you sleep with her and let's have a kid. Then when she's able to have a kid, she's like, well, get rid of him. And so not only is there strife between two wives, which, gosh, I couldn't even imagine. Like one wife is enough, right? Like two wives. <laughs> Whew. Uh, so like they're at each other's throats and then, and now it's two moms are at each other's throats and this family's going to be divided in such a way that these brothers are not going to have a relationship. In chapter 25, we see Jacob and Esau come into play and we see favoritism and, and other trends continue in this family. Uh, and then in chapter 26, we see another trend. So flip to chapter 26, you see this in verse 7 says, when the men of that place asked him, they're asking Isaac, is Isaac and Rebekah, okay, so Abraham's son and his wife, they said, they asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. What? Because he was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought that the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah because she was beautiful. So when Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked down and out of a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she's really your wife. Why did you tell me she's my sister? You guys see that? The same sick lie that his dad told, he's telling. It's just so, so bad, right? It just keeps getting worse. And, and so then Isaac and Rebekah, they had these two boys, Jacob and Esau and if you know the story of Jacob and Esau, you know Jacob, uh, his name means liar or deceiver. 
and, and he steals his brother's birthright, and then in a, in a, uh, in, in a display of favoritism, his mom uh, takes him and like orchestrates this plot to trick his father into giving him uh, the, 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 the lion's share of the inheritance and, and all of these kinds of things. It, it just becomes a really, really destructive thing where then the family is then separated and he has to go off and he has to go now live in his uncle's house where he decides he wants to marry Rachel, but his uncle tricks him and lies to him, deceives him and gives him Leah instead, which is one of the funniest stories in all the Bible because like then morning came and there was Leah. And it's like, oh, uh, and... Um, <laughs> So anyway, it's like it's like one of these things, like surprise. Uh, but his, and then and then he has to work another seven years to get this other wife, and so now he's got two wives, just like his grandfather had two wives, and then they're not happy with each other. I mean, they bicker and fight and all kinds of stuff, and one of them can't have kids. So then she gives a slave girl to him to have a child and have a family, and now he's got thirteen sons from four different women, and they're all at each other's throats and have all this division and all this chaos, even to the point that they sell their brother Joseph into slavery in Egypt and lie about it for years. And some of you guys, you're, you're thinking to yourself like, oh, and I thought my family was screwed up. <laughs> and some of you are like, man, I totally relate with that, right? <laughs> like, you're like right there with me. Like, the reality is, is that like, man, like this is, you just see in this family, generation after generation, there are these patterns of lying, of sexual sin, of hatred, of division, of unresolved conflict, all continuing from one generation to the next. And just finding its way through the families. But then we hear about this amazing thing in Genesis chapter 50. One of the most amazing things that, like, is, is probably one of the most unpredictable things that we see in the Scripture. It's one of the most famous things uh, we look at in the Bible. So if you will flip over to Genesis chapter 50. Joseph has been in Egypt. He's gone through a lot. He was sold into slavery, but God was with him throughout the whole process and took care of him and was there with him. And he says this to his brothers. His brothers are worried that he's going to enact revenge now that their father Jacob is dead. And, and Joseph says this to his brothers. In a family that is screwed up and as divided as it can be, this is what he says to his brothers. He says, don't be afraid. I am, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but, I, but, but God intended it for good to accomplish what was being done, the saving of many lives. Jacob becomes second in command of all of Egypt, and he was in charge of a food distribution program that would save people during the, the time of a famine. And he says, so then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. In any of all the families that you can look at in the scriptures to find a, a interaction like this, where he is so kind and compassionate and loving and caring, not seeking revenge. Like, of all the families where you would think, like, he would be justified for enacting every ounce of revenge that he could think of. He doesn't. And it makes me question, and it makes me wonder, like, what, what causes that kind of response? What, in, like, what brings out that kind of response in Joseph? How can Joseph have that kind of perspective? And if you get nothing else today, and this is all you walk away with, I hope you will walk away with this. Because this is really, really important. At some point, at some point, Joseph started living in his father's house instead of his father's house. He started letting himself be fathered by God and accepted his position as one of God's sons. And he walked with God through life, even to the point that when he was tempted to be promiscuous with another woman and have an affair, right? Which, if you look at, if you look at Joseph's family tree, every man would have said yes. Every man would have absolutely said yes. But Joseph says, I won't do that. I won't dishonor God in that way. I won't dishonor my father in that way. 
And what he had done is he had removed his identity from being a son of Jacob to being a son of God first and foremost. He had removed himself from his family of origin and put himself in the new family of God. And the beautiful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you and I, because of Jesus, because he dies on the cross for our sins, because he loves us and he, he, he gives himself up for us while we are still sinners, you and I have an opportunity to live and take our identity and live in the new family of Jesus. No matter how messed up or how screwed up or how broken our family of origin might be. And no matter how great and how much of a blessing our family of origin might be. We find our identity first and foremost as sons and daughters of God in the new family of Jesus. And as we walk with and abide with this loving father who loves us so much that he comes and is willing to die on the cross for our sins. We begin to live and be, be shaped and molded and formed into his image instead of the image of our household. And we ultimately begin to walk with a God who loves us and who calls us his son, calls his daughter, who says, I care for you. As long as you're living in my house, I'll provide for you. I'll watch over you. I will walk with you. I will empower you. I will speak to you. I will give you wisdom. I'll show you my way of life. Which is going to be far better than any other life you could imagine. We have access to this life. We have access to being these children of God through Jesus Christ. You and I have a chance to live in the Father's house. And we don't have to just live in our Father's house. Now, one of the ways in which I think this oftentimes uh, can show up and where we can identify uh, whose house are we living in is by thinking about the family of origin we live in and maybe the commands um, that we adhere to that are unbiblical. That there are certain things that whether spoken about or just innately passed down to you by your family of origin that you were told, do it this way. And sadly, a lot of those things are unbiblical. And so I've come up with a list of 10 unbiblical family commands. And I'm not trying to say that all of you deal with this, okay? Because maybe none of you deal with these things. Um, I can't imagine that you don't deal with something in these areas. But, but I'm going to give you 10 unbiblical family commands that if, if the shoe fits, then wear it. Wrestle with it. Try and navigate it. Try and overcome it by being a part of the new family of Jesus, okay? So here's, here's like 10 unbiblical family commands that we oftentimes hear about. The first one is we have commands about money. We have commands about money. And oftentimes in our homes, money is the best source of security. Oftentimes we're told that money, uh, the more money we have, the more important we are. Oftentimes in our homes... We are told that money, make lots of money and prove that you made it. And that's the really how money is supposed to be looked at and held up. What about conflict? These really resonate with me in my, my life. Avoid conflict at all cost, is what we're told. Don't get people mad at you. Loud, angry, constant fighting is normal. This is just, just normal life. If you grow, can I? Just, so many people, I, I, I'll do, I'll do counseling with folks, and a lot of times when I ask them, uh, one of the things I ask them is like, "Well, tell me a little bit about how you grew up." I'm like, well, I grew up pretty normal, and I was like, "Well, what does normal look like for you?" Because for some people, normal is dad explodes every 45 minutes. Mom is super passive aggressive. Right? That's sometimes normal. Uh, here's a, here's a um, command, uh, an unbiblical command in regards to sex. Uh, sex is not to be spoken about openly. Men can be promiscuous and women must be chaste. 
Grief and loss. You guys ever deal with loss or grief? A lot of times we're told sadness is a sign of weakness. You're not allowed to be depressed. Get over your losses and quickly move on. Does any of that resonate in your house? Expressing anger. Anger is dangerous and bad. Explode in anger to make a point. That one really hits home in my house. <laughs> Sarcasm is an acceptable way to release anger. Here's a here's a unbiblical family command. You owe your parents for all they have done for you. Don't speak of your family's dirty laundry in public as if they don't already know your dirty laundry because they know you, okay? Just just so you know, everybody knows. Duty duty to family and culture comes before everything. Here's some unhealthy, unbiblical commands about relationships. Don't trust people. They will only let you down. Don't ever let anyone hurt you, as if you can control that. Don't show vulnerability. Just push everything under the surface. Hide it. Put on a mask every day when you go to work, when you go to school, when you're around people. Attitudes toward other cultures. Only be close friends with people who are like you. Don't marry a person of another race or culture. Certain cultures and races are not as good as ours. People of other cultures and races are dangerous. What about attitudes toward success or commands toward success? Uh, success looks like getting into the best schools. Success looks like making lots of money. Success is getting married and having children. Here you go, last one. The, ten, the tenth command of, uh, or unbiblical command of family uh, is about feelings and emotions. You are not allowed to have certain feelings. Your feelings are not important. Reacting with your feelings without thinking is okay. Now, for every unbiblical command in that regard, there are biblical commands that you begin to live in when you begin to live in the Father's house. When you begin to live, um, when you begin to live in the new family of Jesus, and that's what this looks like. Here's more biblical commands. That, that, that line up with more of, of living in the family of Jesus. When you're living in the family of Jesus, money is something we remember we are a steward of and that God owns it all. It, it all belongs to Him. Money is a, a, an opportunity for us to be generous when we get a chance. Money um, is, is an opportunity to live within our means and not take out unnecessary debt. Conflict. We do, don't avoid conflict, but we learn how to negotiate differences. We allow God to mature us through conflicts. We eliminate dirty fighting tactics such as attack and blame and passive aggressiveness and appeasement. When it comes to sex, we receive our sexuality, our maleness and our femaleness as a beautiful gift from God. And God created us that way. It is a gift to be taken and lived in because it is his beautiful gift to us. We are to preserve the preciousness of sexual intimacy for the covenant of marriage. And we do not use people or let ourselves be used. Grief and loss. Our griefs and losses are important to God. You know, in Jesus, he lost a good friend and he wept. He didn't push his emotions down. He grieved. Pay attention and wait on him in our losses. And grieving our losses instead of ignoring them leads to maturity and compassion. Expressing anger. Explore the hurts and fears behind anger. Do not stuff 
or project anger, but use it to assert yourself. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. In regards to the family, thank God for his sovereignly placing you in your family of origin. It might be a mess. But you can still be a blessing to them. Thank God for your family that you're in. Leave the sinful patterns of your family, your country, and your culture. Learn to do life differently in the family of Jesus. Relationships. Repair ruptured relationships as much as possible. Respect each person's individuality for healthy togetherness. And receive God's love in order to give love to others. Attitudes towards other cultures. No one is inferior or superior in God's family. Each culture offers a redemptive gift to the world. Racism, ethnocentrism, classism, and sexism do not belong in God's family. Success. Become the person God intends and do His will. That's success. Learn from your failures. Live in brokenness depending on God. Feelings and emotions. Pay attention to your emotions as a gift from God and a source of information. Don't let them captivate you, but let them inform you on where you are. Let them be a source of information. Prayfully and carefully think about your feelings before you act on them. The last one, experience your emotions in order to love others well. Experience the things that you need to experience. See, the truth is, is that households, if we're honest, are the most formative places in our life. The most formative place in your life, your whole entire life, has been your house. The most formative place that is going to be the case for your children is going to be your house. I have, I have friends who, who choose to um, protect their kids from certain things um, or not let their kids indulge in certain things or experience certain things. And I think that that's a great, great thing, right? And they're trying to protect them from the influence other people will have on them. That's all they're trying to do. And I think that that's a great way to love your kids. But I also think that, that sometimes um, we forget... That we don't just have to protect them from the influence of other people, but we actually have the most influence in their life of anybody. That's just what we're given as their parents. We will always have more influence than the school system. We will always have more influence than bad TV and bad movies. We will always be able to shape and mold our children better than any of those other things. Because the household is the most formative place. It was for you growing up. But my guess is if you have if you've been if you've been captive to some of those unbiblical commands, if you've been living that way because that's the way your family told you to live in regards to money and conflict and stress and emotions and feelings, if that's how you are responding is the way your family responds, likely you're probably struggling with a lot of that stuff. And that's where we have to begin to find our identity in the new family of Jesus. We have to wrestle with that. And we have to begin to learn and deal with those things appropriately, letting God father us and be our father. Compassionate and gracious. Slow to anger, abounding in loyal love and faithfulness. And as we let him father us, and we walk with him, we will begin to change and transform into His image. That will become the most formative thing in our life. And we will begin to impact others out of that formation. And we will begin to absolutely bless our families. And our households will be shaped into these places of love and joy and peace and hope. But we have to stop living in these unbiblical family commands. 
We have to notice the sin patterns in our family. And we have to try and reject them and move beyond them and deal with them the way Jesus would deal with them, not the way our uncle deals with them. Or else we might just keep passing them down from one generation to another. And so here's what I want to encourage you to do. Pete Scazzaro is the writer of a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. One, I would encourage all of you to read that book. It's a really great book, and he deals with a lot of these principles in that book. But he, uh, but he says this. He says, you have to go backward in order to go forward. And what he means by that is you have to actually go back into your family of origin. And you have to begin to kind of, like, break down some of the things that have happened in your past. That, that, that your grandparents passed to your parents and your parents have passed to you. In order, you have to go back there and you have to begin to kind of see those things and see those patterns and look at those things and look at the places that are actually not super healthy in order that you can move forward and become more healthy. In order that you can move forward and become more like Jesus wants us to be. But we have to, but we have to go backward in order to go forward. So I encourage you to try your best to do that. Have conversations with your parents. Ask your parents about your grandparents if you didn't know them. If you do know your grandparents, ask your grandparents about your great-grandparents. Ask them about the great things that happened, but also ask them about the hard things that happened. Go backwards so you can go forward. And so you can take your family forward. So you can take the generations after you forward. Because you're leaving a legacy. You're leaving a legacy one way or another. I just hope it's a legacy of blessing and not of curses. Of generational blessing instead of struggle and strife, division and unresolved conflict. So, that's our vision for family. One of the things we will try and do to help your family, if you will just engage with us and let us help, we'd love to be there for you. And, uh, and begin working and doing the hard work of going backwards so we can all go forward together. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. and We praise you so much uh, for just the way in which the way in which you work and move in our lives. God, I thank you just for the opportunities that we have um, to come to your word and see that, you know, we're not alone when we think that our family's messed up. That we're not alone when we see the struggle. That we're not alone when we see conflict and lying, sexual sin. That this is something that has been going for generation after generation. But God, I just pray. I pray that we will truly accept and live in our salvation. That we'll live in the salvation we have in Christ Jesus that calls us your sons and your daughters. That we might be able to find ourselves living out of an identity where we are a part of the new family of Jesus. And that is our, our main identity. That is our main, um, like, driving force to life. God, I just pray that you will, you will bring about transformation and formation and shape the households of this church into places of love and joy and peace and hope by them, their, their, their due diligence to, to let you go to work, to let you bring out the best in their family by going to work in them. And helping them identify the things that, that need to be identified in order to really find true, true growth. To truly be able to live in this new identity you've given us. And so God, I just pray that you be with these families. These moms, these dads, these grandparents, these great-grandparents, the, the children. 
God, just be with them. Bring them together. Build them together in love and in unity. God, I pray that you will, I pray that you will always help us see and never let us forget how great we are loved by you. And no matter where we are with our family of origin, God, that we have a place in your house, in your family, as your sons and as your daughters. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, in just a second, I'm going to invite you guys around the room to these tables. There's one back here and two up front and then one back in that back corner uh, to take communion. And it's, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8 says this says that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That this is a demonstration of his love, his loyal love, his compassion. This is how he loves us, that he comes and he dies for us. And he says that as often as you come together, remember this. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget my love. Don't forget my compassion. Don't forget that I have, I have paid the ultimate price to show you how much I truly love you. To turn you from sinners to sons and daughters. And so today as you make your way to the table and you take the broken body and you take the cup, my hope and my prayer is that you'll just sit with it for a moment. And that you'll know that by, without a shadow of a doubt that because of this body and because of his blood, you are a son and a daughter in the family of Jesus. You've been adopted. And the family that you've been adopted into is beautiful, it's diverse, it's amazing. And we have an opportunity to live in that family every day. So I'm going to invite you to stand and make your way to these tables whenever you feel led. Take communion and remember that you're a part of the family of Jesus.